Good evening, everyone. Can, can, can you all hear me? It, it sounds a bit strange to me, the, but I think it's, it's fine, right? Okay, good. Good evening. Very happy to be here. Um, so I will be speaking for about half an hour about democracy, but the real work will be up to you after half an hour because we will try to practice conversational democracy, meaning that we will try to have a bit of a brainstorm thinking about how we could improve democracy. And I will give instructions later on. But first, some reflections on democracy and actually why we are having this talk and why it's necessary to have this brainstorm about how to improve democracy. Um, and um, when I'm in Leuven teaching for first year students at, the, at political science, I'm, I'm always asking this question, what is democracy? And you get a wealth of, uh, of, of, of answers there, uh, mostly about elections, mostly about campaigning. Um, but in essence, it's quite, quite mysterious process if you go back to the, to the roots of it. And I want you to th think a little bit about how um, strange, appealing, magical, you could almost say, this process of democracy really is. It is, a, in fact, if you think about it, a form of reduction. So democracy is government by the people for the people. But how do you do that? You cannot let everyone in society participate in governing a society. So it has to be, by definition, almost reductive. Or otherwise put, Democracy is a bit of a utopian project. Utopia means you can never actually fulfill it, you can never actually realize it, you can only approximate it. So democracy is a constant exercise in approximating the ideal without ever reaching the ideal. Now, we have um, in our current societies, in our current established democracies, a set of rules, a set of ideas and, and uh, institutions with which we regularly use to do that reductive exercise. Most commonly elections um, and everything which involves uh, this representation through elections. Now, what I want to, my big idea for today and the thing that I want you to, to think about in, in, in the brainstorm later on is are elections today still the best way or the definite way to think about democracy to, to realize, the best way to realize our current democracies. Um, we have this natural teleological view of history. We tend to think of our own times as the accomplishment of a, of a previous history and we think of our times usually as sort of the culmination point, the end point, where everything has been decided, where everything's ready, and elections and democracy seem to be like the end of the road. That's where we've, where we've arrived. But in fact, I think they're quite an old-fashioned way of doing democracy. They're, they're part of democracy, sure, but they're not simply the only thing that's, that, if, that is fit for the way our societies work today. They're old-fashioned in a sort of 18th, 19th century way the time when they were invented and when they were popularized across the countries that we now know as democracies. So in a way, I would say democracies and election, it's a bit of an old marriage. We have to see how we can spice it up again. And one of the ways we can try to do that is actually doing the opposite of what we can intuitively might do, namely intuitively might think of how to innovate towards the future, all right? That's what we got to do, but we might do that by first looking to the past and look at the origins of democracy. Because of course, this reductive element, this puzzle of how you go from the many to the few, how you do that practically, governing a society, it's an old question. It's a question as old as democracy itself. So we might have a brief look at how the Athenians in ancient Greece looked at democracy, maybe there's something to learn from the way they actually grappled with this particular problem of going from the many to the few. Now, if you look at this Athenian times, the fifth century uh, BC, you see a couple of remarkable things. First of all, elections, yes, there was, elections were there, they were part of the democratic game and the democratic cocktail that was being invented and that was stumbled upon at those times. But there was more than that. Um, 
some surprising things, in fact. One of the things you might remember from history lessons that democracy was invented right at the time when theater in ancient Greece was invented. You might think theater and, and democracy, what is the link between each other? Actually, there's a lot of links, and even until today, we see that there are a lot of links between theater and democracy, because we tend to see democracy, the democratic game, elections as a sort of theater with protagonists who are on the stage. Even if you look at the architecture of our current parliaments, they very much look like theater rooms, theater halls in which an audience sits and sometimes debates when they're parliamentarians, but sometimes there's an audience sitting in front of the television quite passively looking at the protagonists who then have this spectacle going on. So the ancient Greeks had a, a bit of that too, that theater uh, was a place where a lot of politics was taking place. Um, actually, politicians were present uh, at the ancient tragedies looking at all the, the dilemmas that were sketched by Aeschylus and Sophocles and all these authors of the time. The theater and politics was very closely intermingled in those days. So that's quite interesting. What's also interesting is that the, the, the ancient Greeks, the Athenians, had a sort of parliament, an assembly, ecclesia it was called, maybe you remember that too from history lessons, but it was a bit different from our parliament or our executives uh, that we know today. It was a big gathering of people. In principle, every citizen of Athens, of the polis, could participate in these big meetings. So in principle, it could be gatherings of 40,000 people. Uh, in practice, there they, they weren't many times that there were all 40,000 present, but there were large meetings of 6,000, 5,000 people. And in this context, decisions were somehow made. Now, that's quite interesting. How do you make a decision with so many people? The Athenians grappled with this. They wanted to do this. And the reason why they wanted to involve as many people in some sort of parliamentary setting was that they really believed in the right of voice, the right to speak, the equality of voice, the equality of participation in democracy. In fact, you can see that this early democracy was a radical participatory democracy. They had this term for this, isagoria, the equality of citizens to participate and to speak in public, to voice their opinion about how democracy would develop and how decisions were being made. Um, along the way, we seem to have lost this isagoria principle. Of course, it was hugely complex to do that. Uh, but the Athenians were obsessed with it. They, find, they found it very important. What you see is that in the next centuries, and certainly during the last couple of centuries, when we practice democracy, we've forgotten a bit about this whole voice and equality of participation uh, element. And our focus has been much more on representation and on efficiency. And the result of that is elections as we now know them, which <coughs> In everyone can participate in, many more people uh, certainly uh, today than in uh, ancient Athens where obviously as you know women couldn't vote and slaves couldn't vote and so on and so forth. So we have a more inclusive democracy today. But on the other hand we've lost something along the way as well and that's the element of voice. We traded voice for vote. We all have a vote but the speaking element is absent. Another thing that the ancient Greeks had, and which we know from today, is competition. And this competition takes place on stage in the form of a debate. Now, I mentioned theater before. The theater was a place where people could debate and we could see these debates because politicians were also present uh, in these theater performances in the audience. And sometimes they were mocked during comedies and during satyr plays. Now, interestingly enough, I think we've taken the element of competition from that time into our current times, but we've forgotten something else, which is that the debates um, were much more nuanced than just simply mud fights, as we sort of recognize them from current, days, current day uh, elections. There were not only competitions, there were attempts to exchange information about the different points of view being part of the political discussion. And the Greeks had a great term for that. They called that an agon. 
I don't know if people here in the room are familiar with Greek history, but in any case, so agon, you could simply um, translate that as uh, a competition or a debate, but it's in fact a little bit more than that. And there's a, um, uh, a political philosopher, Chantal Mouffe, who has uh, written this um, basically repertoire, a book and, and several, several articles on the term agonistic democracy. And it's interesting what she meant by that, because she means by that uh, something, it's very complicated, but I'm reducing that story as well to something, something quite simple. By focusing on agon, she means that a debate, a competition within democratic politics shouldn't necessarily be antagonistic, but it shouldn't necessarily be consensus-based either or consensus-oriented either. It should be something in between, and that something in between is searching for differences, for ideological differences, highlighting these ide ideological differences, and ha then having a, a conversation about it, a conversation, a debate if you want, but then debate not in the sense that we know it from the American presidential debate, for example, a debate about it which is driven by curiosity to know exactly where the differences are, to explore systematically those differences in order to highlight them, in order that people who then make a choice on which decision to take know better which decision they are actually taking. It seems that current debates are meant to do exactly the opposite. The, first of all, they bamboozle voters into all sorts of decisions that they really don't know what they are voting for. And secondly, it seems like there's a lot of pandering towards the voter going on, so that in the end, at the end of the debate, you have the feeling that the candidates more or less want the same. So you have a feeling of no real difference, or at least it's vague, the difference is vague. It's not highlighted, it's not precise. So agonistic democracy really wants to make that more precise. And here, I think also the old terms, going back to this cocktail of measures and ideas and institutions that the Athenians had in these early days of democracy are actually useful to think about democracy today. Now, you could ask, why, why do we need to go back? What are the problems, in fact, with democracy? We have a lot of democracy going on. Maybe there's even too much democracy going on. We have referendums, we have elections, we have multi-layered institutions. Um, is there really a problem with democracy? We have newspapers, we have a lot of opinion pages in those newspapers. People can be informed in, in ways that are unprecedented. So is there, in fact, a problem? Well, I think there is a problem, and there's a lot of literature on that. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to mention, I, I can't hide my profession, a couple of um, interesting books, uh, academic books, but very readable academic books that I actually recommend you to read to get a bit of more grasp about on that, um, on the, the limitations of the current interpretation of democracy. One is um, an American sociologist, Michael Mann, wrote about the dark side of democracy. And simply put, The Dark Side of Democracy is a book about the tyranny of the majority. It's a, that's also an, an old term. But the, the importance of that book is that it shows that a lot of the things that we see um, today in the world where things go really badly wrong, where you have a civil war um, uh, erupting, where you have um, all sorts of forms of uh, uh, ethnic strife, now, these are not necessarily contradictory to democracy. In fact, they might be a result of a certain interpretation of democracy in which you emphasize the, the power of the majority. Um, the, the big disadvantage of democracy is that we tend to think of the result of democracy or that we tend to think of as uh, that we begin to think of democracy in terms of majorities and minorities. There's almost no other way around it. Majorities and minorities um, are um, in itself perhaps not uh, dangerous, but if you get a lot of um, political um, energy around these, these um, uh, these categories, you might end up in a very tense situation. So it's always important to keep in mind, this is a bit of 
Michael Mann's big lesson that if you have a democracy, there's always a danger inside a democracy, in the DNA of democracy, of something bad happening in the end with minorities and majorities, with the majority turning against the minority. So we should be careful with that heritage of democracy. It's not simply innocent. It's, it's in itself a dangerous tool, or it can be dangerous. It has potential danger. Now, the upside of that, the, the light side of democracy, if you want, is that within democracy, there are also the tools to remedy that problem. And the tool, the simple tool to remedy that problem is always to think about the minority. Democracy is not the power of the majority. It's the need for the majority to always keep in mind the interests of the minority. So that's a, an, an important aspect of democracy, a crucial aspect of democracy. So that's Michael Mann's book. Another uh, um, strand of literature uh, is about democratization. If you democratize a dictatorship somewhere in the world by external means to stimulate that democratization, the, bad, the, the worst thing you can do is to simply force that country to hold elections and then think that the rest will follow automatically. Um, it's like you uh, give them a very primitive tool and say, we, 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 will, we, will, we will not further engage in anything else here. Uh, and then with that tool, uh, you have to uh, find out yourself how, how you will organize your democracy. I think democratization should be much fuller engagement than simply that, uh, because the literature shows, the research shows, that when you have dictatorships ending and the introduction of democracy simply by um, uh, introducing election, elections, that actually the violence um, uh, rises instead of uh, diminishes. So there's an important lesson there. There's a whole strand of literature there too. And then finally, the third problem that I want to indicate with democracy is the problem that we are, I think, more, becoming more and more familiar with, even in established democracies, that is the misuse of seemingly democratic rules and democratic methods for undemocratic uh, ends, or at least for ends that might not be so democratic um, uh, in the end. Um, Referenda um, have been used for genuine purposes to support democracy, and there's a whole tradition of referendums in Switzerland where it works, seems to work relatively well. But referendums we see in Europe uh, are in recent times often used to manipulate um, communities and voters into a particular choice. And there's a lot of disinformation uh, going on during referendum campaigns. So referendums seem to be the ultimate democratic tool, but in the end, they end up to serve a lot of distrust among people towards the governing um, elites. Um, the same thing you see, for example, in countries that are um, uh, clearly dictatorships where democratic, the seemingly democratic tools are adopted, they can be referendum, but they, the referenda, but they can also be elections, for example, and um, election campaigns that look very democratic, but they're used to um, um, install a system that is not democratic at all. I was in, uh, in Belarus uh, a couple of months ago, and there you see it in operation. The Belarusian uh, dictator, Lukashenko, in the 1990s, he simply had the secret police and it wasn't there wasn't anything more necessary to win the elections than the secret police and some force uh, from, from, from uh, the authorities. But you see in recent times that Lukashenko has embraced populist campaigns um, to look more democratically, I imagine. Uh, I can't see no other reason why he would do it. But you see pictures of him appearing with Gérard Depardieu, for example, um, the, who, as you know, uh, has become a, a Russian citizen in order to evade taxes in France. Um, or he dresses up in the national colors. It's not necessary for anything um, other than just showing that apparently this is the way democracy is functioning and then you have to indeed pander the population and um, engage in some nationalism. 
Now, what's the solution to all of that? Or maybe just one, one other footnote and one book that I recently read, which I find quite fascinating with regard to the American elections. Um, there's this book, Democracy for Realists, by Aiken and Bartos, two political scientists in the US, who actually did interesting, intriguing research on why voters vote for a particular candidate or a particular party. And um, it's complex statistical research, but their overall conclusion is that, that the, what the politician says and what the policy preferences of that politician are, uh, are not important, are not crucial, are not significant in guiding people towards one or other candidate, one or other party. But what then counts? What drives them towards one party or to another party? And their conclusion is events. And sometimes these events are quite irrelevant. They did fascinating research from, the 19, in the 19, from material from the 1910s from some state in um, the east of uh, the United States where a very popular uh, governor at one point saw his voter base completely collapse over a couple of months. And the only thing it, was, it, could, be, it could be linked to was the fact that there were there was a problem with sharks on the coast and there were some accidents with uh, people being eaten by sharks and that got, got a lot of attention in, in, in the press. Events like that can turn people very worried about something and then it reflects when there is an election, it reflects directly on uh, their voter choice. Uh, other research in that book is about approval ratings for the president. If there is an, a certain sports event where the Americans perform very well, you see that the approval ratings for the presidents go up. Um, one hasn't got to do anything with the, with the other, but apparently it influences a certain atmosphere in society and people are guided collectively in their uh, voting decisions by that. Okay, so. What do we do with this? What is then the solution? Well, there's no one solution, obviously. The only thing I think we can do is constantly keep thinking about possible solutions, possible ways to deal with this magical process of democracy that we have, to deal with this inherent reductive process. Um, I think democracy, more or less, is like a muscle. If you keep exercising a muscle, it stays in shape. If you, stay, if you don't exercise it, it becomes petrified and uh, the muscle dies out. And I, I have a fear that with elections and our complacency of having arrived at the ultimate institution, uh, institutions of democracy, that we have the machinery in place, that idea I think is an inherent dangerous idea because it kills the muscle. We don't exercise anymore. So we should constantly think about how to reshape and rethink that reductive process in order to reach a healthier democracy. Now, how can we do that? Well, there are many ways to, to do that, um, but one I would like to uh, suggest tonight for as a topic for discussion is through conversation. Um, I already mentioned um, Chantal Mouffe's idea of an agon agonistic democracy agon being something else and something more than simply a debate between black and white or a debate in which there's a winner and a loser. I think that's one of the ways in which you can understand conversation. It's an attempt to uh, go beyond the adversarial element that seems to be inherent in a lot of electoral campaigning and an electoral debating today. Um, what are the ways to foster such a conversational democracy? I will talk about some of the tools later on, some of the practical tools you might employ there. But there's a couple of, um, um, how do you call it, a couple of presumptions, a couple of things that you have to have before you can start employing those tools. I think what is extremely important, uh, I am, I've been reading a lot about this uh, lately, and I think, I think it's really of crucial importance, that is um, a, installing a culture of democracy, democracy in this fuller sense, in this sense of uh, um, a machinery that is constantly changing, in a sense of a muscle that needs exercise, installing a culture of democracy through education. 
And of course, this, on the one hand, this is an old theme. Um, uh, John Dewey, the American philosopher, already wrote in 1916 a book called Democracy and Education, where he made exactly that argument. He said, we should make schools more democratic, have in schools more um, uh, exercise, more um, methods to engage pupils and students into a democratic conversation. Um, I think it's an, old, it's an old topic, it's an old conversation, I, uh, an, old, an old theme, and I can, I can give you a couple of other examples later on if you want, of, of in experiments during the 20th century where, that, where quite bold attempts have been done to use um, a democratic conversation in education. But I think it's time to revive that. And it's time to revive that in a double way, I think. At the time when John Dewey wrote his book, Democracy in Education, his goal was mainly at the time to, in, to make pupils and students more democratic, to teach them democratic attitudes uh, in the classroom. But I think today, perhaps some schools are already trying to do that more and more, we should try to think of ways to bring that democratic attitude that is being taught in school to the broader society. So we should see where the schools of democracy are outside of the school, or how can we make society more like a school where democratic attitudes are being taught. Um, secondly, I think there's, I would also make a plea for more um, an architecture, a political architecture for democratic conversation. We don't have that so much. What do I mean by that? Well, it's more of what we, what we have today is a, a, an architecture for a spectacle, for a political drama. We have, like I said, the parliamentary arena. We have television. We have the newspapers. There's a lot of drama. We have campaigns and so on. There's drama with protagonists. Um, and everything seems to be shaped around that. You can imagine a space where a political debate is, being take, is taking place in a, in a television studio, and you would automatically see how that television studio looks like, where the opponents would be, how the discussion would, would develop. Um, but there's no real architecture, at least there's a need for more arch architecture where listening is an, sort of an automatic result of the place where you are. This room is more, an, it, it's not a parliamentary room, it's not a television studio. It's a bit strange that I stand here in front of you standing up and you're all sitting down, but we will change that in a minute. So it's, it's more, this is more an architecture for conversation and for listening. And I think there should be more places like that uh, also in um, the, uh, the media. Um, you have that a little bit with citizens' journalism already. I, I think these are developments that we really should watch and where places for democracy and listening can arise. And talking about citizen journalism, this often happens through the internet. And what one of the latest developments we've seen that democracy is not really ready for, I think, at this point, is indeed the participation of citizens in the political debate through social media. Now, there's something very interesting going on here with that. Um, on the one hand, you could say this is very positive. A lot of people ha can broadcast their own ideas. That's fantastic. There's much more voice there. Yes, but if you look at the way these conversations go, they're often not really conversations. They're threat of, threats of responses and reactions to each other. And it's going nowhere. And if it's going badly, in often goes badly, then it's a shouting match, but then uh, online. So I think here, too, there's um, uh, room for improvement to improve the digital conversation. And I think it's crucially important because what you see, what I notice, is that the real conversation tends to imitate slowly the online conversation, the threat conversation. It used to be the other way around. You had like on the internet chat rooms where, where people were sort of imitating the cafe setting where everyone could equally participate. But now it seems if you look at television programs that Twitter feeds are appearing on, uh, during the debate. So what you have there and people responding on, the, on, on live on what is being said, but there's no, no real discussion. So the real live debate, the real live discussion is sort of imitating 
where we've ended up in the digital conversation. And I think the digital conversation is not very enriching, but instead of enriching the digital conversation, we've reverted to making the real conversation more like the digital conversation. So that's why I think that improving the digital conversation is also a very important task ahead of us. Let me have a look at the time here, and I don't speak too long. I'll try to keep it to five minutes. Uh, I was asked to give you a couple of examples of interesting um, experiments that have been going on with a number of um, uh, organizations, initiatives that try to promote con more conversational democracy. Um, let me just point you out very briefly, I can, I can talk, give you more details later on if you want, um, about three, three initiatives. One is uh, an attempt to improve the digital conversation about priorities, the Better Reykjavik uh, initiative, Better Reykjavik, which is a website, um, and I've, I've talked to the designers of the website, it's very interesting how they in, try to improve the digital conversation about priorities in Reykjavik, where citizens can participate um, on simple things, you know, how to redesign a certain area of the city, or public, uh, public works, and so on. All sorts of ideas can be put forward there on the website. But the interesting thing, what they've done, is that they abolished, or they changed the, the way uh, the conversation looks like um, in this way that it doesn't look like the comment section in a, in a, under a newspaper article, but it's divided in two columns. You immediately have to make a choice between I'm pro or I'm against. You, you're in, you, can't, you could say it's a bit reductive, yes, but like I said, democracy is about reduction. The thing is that if you do it that way, you immediately create something like what I was just calling an agonistic democratic debate. Because you have to make a stand before you even start commenting. So it's not necessary to shout at the other ones that they're stupid, because someone probably will have done it already to begin with, and you see it immediately. But then you have to arg argue, actually. You're, in, you're, in, you're um, stimulated to make an argument, actually, why you are against it or why you are uh, in favor of a certain uh, proposal. There are more. Um, uh, ambitious initiatives with regard to deliberative conversational democracy. There's actually one going on right now that started today in Ireland, which I also can you give you, I can give you also more details about that later on. Um, a citizens assembly. Now, in the Ireland is a very interesting case to watch because they have um, uh, there have been a couple of initiatives over the last few years with large citizens assembly where citizens. Um, ran, were randomly selected, get together for a few days, a weekend, um, a couple of weekends, and discuss matters of constitutional reform. Um, the Constitutional Convention in 2014 in Ireland was an initiative like that, and it actually led to a, a referendum on um, marriage equality, um, which you might remember in 2015, uh, went on. This was a very interesting process, how a very touchy subject in the Irish society was suddenly brought out of the taboo sphere into the public debate, and you could actually have a very interesting, um, decent discussion about that through the fact that there was an organized setting in which this could be discussed, where randomly selected citizens could participate in a discussion next to parliamentarians. I can give you more details later on if you want. Um, um, I can, well, I will stop with the examples because time is going is is uh, is going fast, and you know, these examples take a little take a little while to explain in detail. Um, but let me put you to work. Actually, that's um, the re the reason why we uh, why we're all here. In fact, I'm interested in the result as well, obviously. So. <laughs> And I'm very interested in these memorable sentences that you will come up with uh, and how beautiful they will be. But the reason actually why these memorable sentences are important is that you actually would listen to what is being said during the conversation because what happens is that we tend to focus so much our, our, on, on our own opinion on, on the matter that we tend to forget what's actually been done, what, what is actually said during the conversation. So even a small sentence that seemingly is unimportant in the discussion can be the most memorable of that, of that discussion, 
of that conversation. And what I would also like to ask you is um, to treat your conversation that you will have on the questions that will be distributed as your collective uh, baby. This will be the main product of what you're doing tonight. This will be your creative enterprise. You're collectively making a piece of music and that is your conversation. So care very much about that. And then I have three ways in which you can care about that and you're free to experiment with it. You, you're not, I mean, I'm, I'm not obliging you to take on any of these ideas, it's just a couple of ideas that I have, um, which might, you know, um, stimulate you to have the conversation in a slightly different way than you usually uh, have a conversation about politics and about society. One is what I would call the expert conversation. And this is the following. I'm deeply convinced that everyone is an expert <coughs> on something that she or he doesn't know she is an, or he is an expert on. So it would be interesting to explore in your group who is an expert on what? And I don't mean, explicitly don't mean your professional expertise. Actually, this is not important at all. It's about your expertise in terms of your life experience. For example, I, I, I could imagine, imagine I've been unemployed for a few months last year. Um, you could think of it, yes, that's a period of my life that I want to forget as quickly as possible. But maybe there is some expertise, some experience that you have that is unique around your table that, that, that nobody else has. So I'm looking for that kind of experience or the experience of having kids or the experience of not having kids or something which is very personal, which has nothing to do with your professional expertise. It would be interesting in the conversation if you could see what, you, what resources on that front, on that experience you have. And then second possibility, if you don't like that, you can have, try to have what I call a utopian conversation. Now, um, uh, Utopia, as you know, is a book by Thomas More. It's, uh, it was uh, this year actually published just 500 years ago. And there's all kinds of celebrations because it was um, published in Leuven um, at the time. Um, now, Utopia, if you've read it, I don't know if anyone has read it, but it's a very strange book. We have this idea that Utopia is an ideal society, but if you read uh, Thomas More's book, yeah, there are some things that are seemingly ideal, but there are lots of things that you don't want to live, that, that you certainly don't want. I mean, it, 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 at some point it more looks like the Soviet Union in the 1970s than, than, than an ideal society. So, what, I, what do I mean by an utopian conversation? Utopian conversation is having one idea, which might be slightly crazy uh, as a response to the question that you have, but then a collective effort to explore that idea further and to go into the unknown and to see what the consequences of that idea are, the positive as well as the negative. And there's one key sentence here that you can use in a utopian conversation. It's the yes and term. I mean, in a conversation about utopian ideas, very often you get yes, but, and then follows, and then it kills a conversation. So don't use yes, but, but use yes and, and see where you end up. So that's the utopian conversation. And then thirdly, that's the simple one, that's the agonistic conversation that I was talking about in uh, the spirit of Chantal Mouffe. So you divide the group in two. And you say, okay, we're going to look at two different possible answers here, and they're very, very different. And we're going to explore the differences and see how far we can get apart from each other, how far we can realistically build a difference in our group and still uh, don't kill each other afterwards. <laughs> okay, so you're allowed to, to work with these methods, but if you don't like it, you can have a normal conversation among your own. That's fine too. And the questions will be given to you. Yeah.